Hello, welcome back. Just before we get started with Ozma of Oz, I wanted to give a big shout out to Sarah. Now, Sarah is the most recent supporter of Willow Audiobooks on Patreon. I literally can't tell you how much it means to me when someone decides to support me that way. So a massive thank you to Sarah and to all my other wonderful patrons. If you're interested to see what the options are for supporting me and want to know what various perks there are, just head on over to Willow Audiobooks on Patreon and it's all explained there. I also wanted to say thank you to anyone who has left a rating or a review on iTunes or any other platform. Again, it really means a lot because it reminds me that there are people listening and enjoying these stories, and it can also really help to grow my listenership, so it's really, really helpful. If you haven't left a review yet, please think about doing so. Finally, just a reminder that you can always keep up with Willow on social media. Just search for Willow Audiobooks on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. I love hearing from people there. And if you want to send me an email, you're very welcome to do that at willowaudiobooks at gmail.com. With that, let's get into L. Frank Baum's third book in the Oz series, Ozma of Oz. I hope you enjoy. This is a Willow Audiobook. Ozma of Oz by L. Frank Baum Read by Stephen Alexander Chapter 1 The Girl in the Chicken Coop The wind blew hard and joggled the water of the ocean, sending ripples across its surface. Then the wind pushed the edges of the ripples until they became waves and shoved the waves around until they became billows. The billows rolled dreadfully high, higher even than the tops of houses. Some of them indeed rolled as high as the tops of tall trees and seemed like mountains, and the gulfs between the great billows were like deep valleys. All this mad dashing and splashing of the waters of the big ocean, which the mischievous wind had caused without any good reason whatever, resulted in a terrible storm and a storm on the ocean is liable to cut many queer pranks and do a lot of damage. At the time the wind began to blow, a ship was sailing far out upon the waters. When the waves began to tumble and toss and to grow bigger and bigger, the ship rolled up and down and tipped sideways, first one way and then the other, and was jostled around so roughly that even the sailor men had to hold fast to the ropes and railings to keep themselves from being swept away by the wind or pitched headlong into the sea. And the clouds were so thick in the sky that the sunlight couldn't get through them, so that the day grew dark as night, which added to the terrors of the storm. The captain of the ship was not afraid, because he had seen storms before and had sailed his ship through them in safety but he knew that his passengers would be in danger if they tried to stay on deck, so he put them all into the cabin and told them to stay there until after the storm was over, and to keep brave hearts and not be scared, and all would be well with them. Now, among these passengers was a little Kansas girl named Dorothy Gale, who was going with her Uncle Henry to Australia to visit some relatives they had never before seen. Uncle Henry, you must know, was not very well, because he had been working so hard on his Kansas farm that his health had given way and left him weak and nervous. So he left Aunt Em at home to watch over the hired men and to take care of the farm, while he travelled far away to Australia to visit his cousins and have a good rest. Dorothy was eager to go with him on this journey, and Uncle Henry thought she would be good company and help cheer him up, 
so he decided to take her along. The little girl was quite an experienced traveller, for she had once been carried by a cyclone as far away from home as the marvellous land of Oz, and she had met with a good many adventures in that strange country before she managed to get back to Kansas again. So she wasn't easily frightened, whatever happened. And when the wind began to howl and whistle, and the waves began to tumble and toss, our little girl didn't mind the uproar the least bit. Of course, we'll have to stay in the cabin, she said to Uncle Henry and the other passengers, and keep as quiet as possible until the storm is over. For the captain says, if we go on deck, we may be blown overboard. No one wanted to risk such an accident as that, you may be sure, so all the passengers stayed huddled up in the dark cabin, listening to the shrieking of the storm and the creaking of the masts and rigging, and trying to keep from bumping into one another when the ship tipped sideways. Dorothy had almost fallen asleep when she was aroused with a start to find that Uncle Henry was missing. She couldn't imagine where he had gone, and as he was not very strong, she began to worry about him and to fear he might have been careless enough to go on deck. In that case, he would be in great danger unless he instantly came down again. The fact was that Uncle Henry had gone to lie down in his little sleeping berth, but Dorothy did not know that. She only remembered that Aunt Em had cautioned her to take good care of her uncle. So at once, she decided to go on the deck and find him, in spite of the fact that the tempest was now worse than ever, and the ship was plunging in a really dreadful manner. Indeed, the little girl found it was as much as she could do to mount the stairs to the deck, and as soon as she got there, the wind struck her so fiercely that it almost tore away the skirts of her dress. Yet Dorothy felt a sort of joyous excitement in defying the storm, and while she held fast to the railing, she peered around through the gloom and thought she saw the dim form of a man clinging to a mast not far away from her. This might be her uncle, so she called as loudly as she could. Uncle Henry! Uncle Henry! But the wind screeched and howled so madly that she scarce heard her own voice, and the man certainly failed to hear her, for he did not move. Dorothy decided she must go to him, so she made a dash forward during a lull in the storm to where a big square chicken coop had been lashed to the deck with ropes. She reached this place in safety, but no sooner had she seized fast hold of the slats of the big box in which the chickens were kept than the wind, as if enraged because the little girl dared to resist its power, suddenly redoubled its fury. With a scream like that of an angry giant, it tore away the ropes that held the coop and lifted it high into the air, with Dorothy still clinging to the slats. Around and over it whirled, this way and that. And a few moments later, the chicken coop dropped far away into the sea, where the big waves caught it and slid it uphill to a foaming crest and then downhill into a deep valley, as if it were nothing more than a plaything to keep them amused. Dorothy had a good ducking, you may be sure, but she didn't lose her presence of mind even for a second. She kept tight hold of the stout slats, and as soon as she could get the water out of her eyes, she saw that the wind had ripped the cover from the coop, and the poor chickens were fluttering away in every direction, being blown by the wind until they looked like feather dusters without handles. The bottom of the coop was made of thick boards, so Dorothy found she was clinging to a sort of raft with sides of slats, which readily bore up her weight. After coughing the water out of her throat and getting her breath again, she managed to climb over the slats and stand upon the firm wooden bottom of the coop, which supported her easily enough. <sighs> Why, I've got a ship of my own, she thought, more amused than frightened at her sudden change of condition. And then, as the coop climbed to the top of a big wave, she looked eagerly around for the ship from which she had been blown. It was far, far away by this time. Perhaps no one on board had yet missed her or knew of her strange adventure. 
down into a valley between the waves, the coop swept her. And when she climbed another crest, the ship looked like a toy boat. It was such a long way off. Soon, it had entirely disappeared in the gloom. And then, Dorothy gave a sigh of regret at parting with Uncle Henry and began to wonder what was going to happen to her next. Just now, she was tossing on the bosom of a big ocean, with nothing to keep her afloat but a miserable wooden hen coop that had a plank bottom and slatted sides, through which the water constantly splashed and wetted her through to the skin. And there was nothing to eat when she became hungry, as she was sure to do before long, and no fresh water to drink, and no dry clothes to put on. "'Well, I declare!' she exclaimed with a laugh. "'You're in a pretty fix, Dorothy Gale, I can tell you, "'and I haven't the least idea how you're going to get out of it.' "'As if to add to her troubles, the night was now creeping on, "'and the grey clouds overhead changed to inky blackness. "'But the wind, as if satisfied at last with its mischievous pranks, "'stopped blowing this ocean.' and hurried away to another part of the world to blow something else, so that the waves, not being joggled any more, began to quiet down and behave themselves. It was lucky for Dorothy, I think, that the storm subsided. Otherwise, brave though she was, I fear she might have perished. Many children in her place would have wept and given way to despair, But because Dorothy had encountered so many adventures and come safely through them, it did not occur to her at this time to be especially afraid. She was wet and uncomfortable, it is true, but after sighing that one sigh I told you of, she managed to recall some of her customary cheerfulness and decided to patiently await whatever her fate might be. By and by, the black clouds rolled away, and showed a blue sky overhead, with a silver moon shining sweetly in the middle of it, and little stars winking merrily at Dorothy when she looked their way. The coop did not toss around any more, but rode the waves more gently, almost like a cradle rocking, so that the floor upon which Dorothy stood was no longer swept by water coming through the slats. Seeing this, and being quite exhausted by the excitement of the past few hours, the little girl decided that sleep would be the best thing to restore her strength, and the easiest way in which she could pass the time. The floor was damp, and she was herself wringing wet, but fortunately this was a warm climate, and she did not feel at all cold. So she sat down in the corner of the coop, leaned her back against the slats, nodded at the friendly stars before she closed her eyes, and was asleep in half a minute. Chapter 2 The Yellow Hen A strange noise awoke Dorothy, who opened her eyes to find that day had dawned and the sun was shining brightly in a clear sky. She had been dreaming that she was back in Kansas again and playing in the old barnyard with the calves and pigs and chickens all round her, and at first, as she rubbed the sleep from her eyes, she really imagined she was there. Ah, here again was the strange noise that had awakened her. Surely it was a hen cackling. But her wide-open eyes first saw, through the slats of the coop, the blue waves of the ocean, now calm and placid, and her thoughts flew back to the past night, so full of danger and discomfort. Also, she began to remember that she was a waif of the storm, adrift upon a treacherous and unknown sea. "'What's that?' cried Dorothy, starting to her feet. "'Why, I've just laid an egg, that's all,' replied a small but sharp and distinct voice. And looking around her, the little girl discovered a yellow hen squatting in the opposite corner of the coop. "'Dear me!' she exclaimed in surprise. "'Have you been here all night too?' "'Of course,' answered the hen, fluttering her wings and yawning. When the coop blew away from the ship, 
I clung fast to this corner with claws and beak, for I knew if I fell into the water I'd surely be drowned. Indeed, I nearly drowned as it was, with all that water washing over me. I never was so wet before in my life. Yes, agreed Dorothy. It was pretty wet for a time, I know. But do you feel comfortable now? Not very. The sun has helped to dry my feathers, as it has your dress. And I feel better since I laid my morning egg. But what's to become of us, I should like to know? Afloat on this big pond? I'd like to know that too, said Dorothy. But tell me, how does it happen that you were able to talk? I thought hands could only cluck and cackle. Why, as for that, answered the yellow hen thoughtfully. I've clucked and cackled all my life and never spoken a word before this morning that I could remember. But when you asked a question a minute ago, it seemed the most natural thing in the world to answer you. So I spoke and I seemed to keep on speaking just as you and other human beings do. Strange, isn't it? Very, replied Dorothy. If we were in the land of Oz, I wouldn't think it so queer, because many of the animals can talk in that fairy country. But out here in the ocean must be a good long way from Oz. How is my grammar? asked the yellow hen anxiously. Do I speak quite properly in your judgment? Yes, said Dorothy. You do very well, for a beginner. I'm glad to know that, continued the yellow hen in a confidential tone, because if one is going to talk, it's best to talk correctly. The red rooster has often said that my cluck and my cackle were quite perfect, and now it's a comfort to know I am talking properly. I'm beginning to get hungry, remarked Dorothy. It's breakfast time, but there's no breakfast. You may have my egg, said the yellow hen. I don't care for it, you know. Don't you want to hatch it? asked the little girl in surprise. No, indeed. I never care to hatch eggs unless I have a nice snug nest in some quiet place with a baker's dozen of eggs under me. That's thirteen, you know, and it's a lucky number for hens. So you may as well eat this egg. Oh, I couldn't possibly eat it unless it was cooked, exclaimed Dorothy. But I'm much obliged for your kindness, just the same. Don't mention it, my dear, answered the hen calmly, and began preening her feathers. For a moment, Dorothy stood looking out over the wide sea. She was still thinking of the egg, though, so presently she asked, Why do you lay eggs when you don't expect to hatch them? It's a habit I have, replied the yellow hen. It has always been my pride to lay a fresh egg every morning, except when I'm molting. I never feel like having my morning cackle till the egg is properly laid, and without the chance to cackle, I would not be happy. It's strange, said the girl reflectively, but as I'm not a hen, I can't be expected to understand that. Certainly not, my dear. Then Dorothy fell silent again. The yellow hen was some company, and a bit of comfort too, but it was dreadfully lonely out on the big ocean nevertheless. After a time, the hen flew up and perched upon the topmost slat of the coop, which was a little above Dorothy's head when she was sitting up on the bottom, as she had been doing for some moments past. <coughs> Why? We're not far from land! exclaimed the hen. Where? Where is it? cried Dorothy, jumping up in great excitement. Over there a little way, answered the hen, nodding her head in a certain direction. We seem to be drifting toward it, so that before noon we ought to find ourselves on dry land again. I shall like that, said Dorothy with a little sigh, for her feet and legs were still wetted now and then by the sea water that came through the open slats. So shall I, answered her companion. There is nothing in the world so miserable as a wet hen. The land, which they seemed to be rapidly approaching, since it grew more distinct every minute, was quite beautiful as viewed by the little girl in the floating hen coop. Next to the water was a broad beach of white sand and gravel, and farther back were several rocky hills, 
while beyond these appeared a strip of green trees that marked the edge of a forest. But there were no houses to be seen, nor any sign of people who might inhabit this unknown land. "'I hope we shall find something to eat,' said Dorothy, looking eagerly at the pretty beach towards which they drifted. "'It's long past breakfast time now.' "'I'm a trifle hungry myself,' declared the yellow hen. "'Why don't you eat the egg?' asked the child. "'You don't need to have your food cooked as I do.' <laughs> "'Do you take me for a cannibal?' cried the hen indignantly. "'I do not know what I have said or done that leads you to insult me.' "'I beg your pardon, I'm sure, Mrs... Mrs... "'By the way, may I inquire your name, ma'am?' asked the little girl. "'My name is Bill,' said the yellow hen, somewhat gruffly. "'Bill? Why, that's a boy's name. "'What difference does that make? "'You're a lady hen, aren't you?' "'Of course. But when I was first hatched out, "'no one could tell whether I was going to be a hen or a rooster. "'So the little boy at the farm where I was born called me Bill "'and made a pet of me because I was the only yellow chicken in the whole brood. "'When I grew up and he found that I didn't crow and fight as all the roosters do, he did not think to change my name, and every creature in the barnyard, as well as the people in the house, knew me as Bill. So Bill I've always been called, and Bill is my name. But it's all wrong, you know, declared Dorothy earnestly, and if you don't mind, I shall call you Belina. Putting the Ena on the end makes it a girl's name, you see. Oh, I don't mind it in the least, returned the yellow hen. It doesn't matter at all what you call me, so long as I know the name means me. Very well, Belina. My name is Dorothy Gale, just Dorothy to my friends, and Miss Gale to strangers. You may call me Dorothy, if you like. We're getting very near the shore. Do you suppose it is too deep for me to wade the rest of the way? Wait a few minutes longer. The sunshine is warm and pleasant, and we're in no hurry. But my feet are all wet and soggy, said the girl. My dress is dry enough, but I won't feel real comfortable till I get my feet dried. She waited, however, as the hen advised, and before long the big wooden coop grated gently on the sandy beach, and the dangerous voyage was over. It did not take the castaways long to reach the shore, you may be sure. The yellow hen flew to the sands at once, but Dorothy had to climb over the high slats. Still, for a country girl, that was not much of a feat, and as soon as she was safe ashore, Dorothy drew off her wet shoes and stockings and spread them upon the sun-warmed beach to dry. Then she sat down and watched Belina, who was pick-pecking away with her sharp bill in the sand and gravel which she scratched up and turned over with her strong claws. "'What are you doing?' asked Dorothy. "'Getting my breakfast, of course,' murmured the hen, busily pecking away. "'What do you find?' inquired the girl curiously. "'Oh, some fat red ants and some sand bugs, and once in a while a tiny crab. They are very sweet and nice, I assure you.' "'How dreadful!' exclaimed Dorothy in a shocked voice. "'What is dreadful?' asked the hen, lifting her head to gaze with one bright eye at her companion. "'Why, eating live things and horrid bugs and crawly ants, you ought to be shamed of yourself!' "'Goodness me!' returned the hen in a puzzled tone. "'How queer you are, Dorothy. Live things are much fresher and more wholesome than dead ones.' "'And you humans eat all sorts of dead creatures.' "'We don't,' said Dorothy. "'You do indeed,' answered Belina. "'You eat lambs and sheep and cows and pigs and even chickens.' "'But we cook them, said Dorothy triumphantly. "'What difference does that make?' "'A good deal,' said the girl in a graver tone. "'I can't just explain the difference, but it's there.' And anyhow, we never eat such dreadful things as bugs. But you eat the chickens that eat the bugs, retorted the yellow hen with an odd cackle. So you are just as bad as we chickens are. This made Dorothy thoughtful. 
What Polina said was true enough, and it almost took away her appetite for breakfast. As for the yellow hen, she continued to peck away at the sand busily and seemed quite contented with her bill of fare. Finally, down near the water's edge, Belina stuck her bill deep into the sand and then drew back and shivered. Ow! she cried. I struck metal that time and it nearly broke my beak. It was probably a rock, said Dorothy carelessly. Nonsense! I know a rock from metal, I guess said the hen. There's a different feel to it. But there couldn't be any metal on this wild, deserted seashore, persisted the girl. Where's the place? I'll dig it up and prove to you I'm right. Belina showed her the place where she had stubbed her bill, as she expressed it, and Dorothy dug away the sand until she felt something hard. Then, thrusting in her hand, she pulled the thing out and discovered it to be a large-sized golden key, rather old, but still bright and of perfect shape. "'What did I tell you?' cried the hen with a cackle of triumph. "'Can I tell metal when I bump into it, or is the thing a rock?' "'It's metal, sure enough,' answered the child, gazing thoughtfully at the curious thing she had found. "'I think it is pure gold, and it must have lain hidden in the sand for a long time.' How do you suppose it came there, Belina? And what do you suppose this mysterious key unlocks? I can't say, replied the hen. You ought to know more about locks and keys than I do. Dorothy glanced around. There was no sign of any house in that part of the country, and she reasoned that every key must fit a lock, and every lock must have a purpose. Perhaps the key had been lost by somebody who lived far away, but had wandered on this very shore. Musing on these things, the girl put the key in the pocket of her dress and then slowly drew on her shoes and stockings, which the sun had fully dried. "'I believe, Belina,' she said. "'I'll have a look round and see if I can find some breakfast.' Chapter 3 Letters in the Sand Walking a little way back from the water's edge, toward the grove of trees, Dorothy came to a flat stretch of white sand that seemed to have queer signs marked upon its surface, just as one would write upon sand with a stick. "'What does it say?' she asked the yellow hen, who trotted along beside her in a rather dignified fashion. "'How should I know?' returned the hen. "'I cannot read.' "'Oh, can't you?' "'Certainly not.' I've never been to school, you know. Well, I have, admitted Dorothy. But the letters are big and far apart, and it's hard to spell out the words. But she looked at each letter carefully, and finally discovered that these words were written in the sand. Beware the whalers. That's rather strange, declared the hen, when Dorothy had read aloud the words. What do you suppose the whalers are? Folks that wheel, I guess. They must have wheelbarrows or baby cabs or handcarts, said Dorothy. Perhaps they're automobiles, suggested the yellow hen. There is no need to beware of baby cabs and wheelbarrows, but automobiles are dangerous things. Several of my friends have been run over by them. It can't be automobiles, replied the girl, for this is a new wild country without even trolley cars or telephones. The people here haven't been discovered yet, I'm sure. That is, if there are any people. So I don't believe there can be any automobiles, Belina. Perhaps not, admitted the yellow hen. Where are you going now? Over to those trees, to see if I can find some fruit or nuts, answered Dorothy. She tramped across the sand, skirting the foot of one of the little rocky hills that stood near, and soon reached the edge of the forest. At first she was greatly disappointed, because the nearer trees were all punita or cottonwood or eucalyptus, and bore no fruit or nuts at all. But, by and by, when she was almost in despair, the little girl came upon two trees that promised to furnish her with plenty of food. One was quite full of square paper boxes, which grew in clusters on all the limbs, 
and upon the biggest and ripest boxes, the word lunch could be read in neat raised letters. This tree seemed to bear all the year round, for there were lunchbox blossoms on some of the branches, and on others tiny little lunch boxes that were as yet quite green, and evidently not fit to eat until they had grown bigger. The leaves of this tree were all paper napkins, and it presented a very pleasing appearance to the hungry little girl. But the tree next to the lunchbox tree was even more wonderful, for it bore quantities of tin dinner pails, which were so full and heavy that the stout branches bent underneath their weight. Some were small and dark brown in colour. Those larger were of a dull tin colour, but the really ripe ones were pails of bright tin that shone and glistened beautifully in the rays of sunshine that touched them. Dorothy was delighted, and even the yellow hen acknowledged that she was surprised. The little girl stood on tiptoe and picked one of the nicest and biggest lunch boxes, and then she sat down upon the ground and eagerly opened it. Inside she found, nicely wrapped in white papers, a ham sandwich, a piece of sponge cake, a pickle, a slice of new cheese and an apple. Each thing had a separate stem and so had to be picked off the side of the box, but Dorothy found them all to be delicious, and she ate every bit of luncheon in the box before she had finished. A lunch isn't exactly breakfast, she said to Belina, who sat beside her curiously watching, but when one is hungry, one can eat even supper in the morning and not complain. I hope your lunch box was perfectly ripe observed the yellow hen in an anxious tone. So much sickness is caused by eating green things. Oh, I'm sure it was right, declared Dorothy. All that is, said the pickle, and a pickle just has to be green, Belina. But everything tasted perfectly splendid, and I'd rather have it than a church picnic. And now I think I'll pick a dinner pail to have when I get hungry again, and then we'll start out and explore the country. "'and see where we are.' "'Haven't you any idea what country this is?' inquired Belina. "'None at all. "'But listen, I'm quite sure it's a fairy country, "'or such things as lunchboxes and dinner pails "'wouldn't be growing upon trees. "'Besides, Belina, being a hen, "'you wouldn't be able to talk in any civilised country like Kansas "'where no fairies live at all. "'Perhaps we're in the land of Oz.' said the hen thoughtfully. No, that can't be, answered the little girl, because I've been to the land of Oz, and it's all surrounded by a horrid desert that no one can cross. Then how did you get away from there again? asked Belina. I had a pair of silver shoes that carried me through the air, but I lost them, said Dorothy. Ah, indeed, remarked the yellow hen in a tone of unbelief. Anyhow, resumed the girl, there is no seashore near the land of Oz, so this must surely be some other fairy country. While she was speaking, she selected a bright and pretty dinner pail that seemed to have a stout handle and picked it from its branch. Then, accompanied by the yellow hen, she walked out of the shadow of the trees toward the seashore. They were part way across the sands, when Belina suddenly cried in a voice of terror, ah, What's that? Dorothy turned quickly around and saw coming out of a path that led from between the trees the most peculiar person her eyes had ever beheld. It had the form of a man, except that it walked, or rather rolled, upon all fours, and its legs were the same length as its arms, giving them the appearance of the four legs of a beast. Yet it was no beast that Dorothy had discovered, for the person was clothed most gorgeously in embroidered garments of many colours, and wore a straw hat perched jauntily upon the side of its head. But it differed from human beings in this respect, that instead of hands and feet, there grew at the end of its arms and legs round wheels, and by means of these wheels it rolled very swiftly over the level ground. Afterward, Dorothy found that these odd wheels were of the same hard substance that our fingernails and toenails are composed of, and she also learned that creatures of this strange race were born in this queer fashion. 
But when our little girl first caught sight of the first individual of a race that was destined to cause her a lot of trouble, she had an idea that the brilliantly clothed personage was on roller skates, which were attached to his hands as well as to his feet. Run! screamed the yellow hen, fluttering away in great fright. It's a wheeler! A wheeler? exclaimed Dorothy. What can that be? Don't you remember the warning in the sand? Beware the wheelers! Run, I tell you! Run! So Dorothy ran, and the wheeler gave a sharp, wild cry and came after her in full chase. Looking over her shoulder as she ran, the girl now saw a great procession of wheelers emerging from the forest. Dozens and dozens of them, all clad in splendid, tight-fitting garments, and all rolling swiftly toward her and uttering their wild, strange cries. They're sure to catch us, panted the girl, who was still carrying the heavy dinner pail she had picked. I can't run much farther, Belina. Climb up this hill, quick, said the hen, and Dorothy found she was very near to the heap of loose and jagged rocks they had passed on their way to the forest. The yellow hen was even now fluttering among the rocks, and Dorothy followed as best she could, half climbing and half tumbling up through the rough and rugged steep. She was none too soon, for the foremost wheeler reached the hill a moment after her. But while the girl scrambled up the rocks, the creature stopped short with howls of rage and disappointment. Dorothy now heard the yellow hen laughing in her cackling henny way. Don't hurry, my dear, cried Belina. They can't follow us among these rocks, so we're safe enough now. Dorothy stopped at once and sat down upon a broad boulder, for she was all out of breath. The rest of the wheelers had now reached the foot of the hill, but it was evident that their wheels would not roll upon the rough and jagged rocks, and therefore they were helpless to follow Dorothy and the hen to where they had taken refuge. But they circled all around the little hill, so the child and Bellina were fast prisoners and could not come down without being captured. Then the creatures shook their front wheels at Dorothy in a threatening manner, and it seemed they were able to speak as well as to make their dreadful outcries, for several of them shouted, We'll get you in time. Never fear. And when we do get you, we'll tear you into little bits. Why are you so cruel to me? asked Dorothy. I'm a stranger in your country and have done you no harm. No harm? cried one who seemed to be their leader. Did you not pick our lunch boxes and dinner pails? Have you not a stolen dinner pail still in your hand? I only picked one of each, she answered. I was hungry, and I didn't know the trees were yours. That is no excuse, retorted the leader, who was clothed in a most gorgeous suit. It is the law here that whoever picks a dinner pail without our permission must die immediately. Don't you believe him, said Belina. I'm sure the trees do not belong to these awful creatures. They are fit for any mischief and it's my opinion they would try to kill us just the same if you hadn't picked a dinner pail. I think so too, agreed Dorothy. But what shall we do now? Stay where we are, advised the yellow hen. We are safe from the wheelers, until we starve to death anyhow. And before that time comes, a good many things can happen. Chapter 4 Tick-tock, the machine man. After an hour or so, most of the band of wheelers rolled back into the forest, leaving only three of their number to guard the hill. These curled themselves up like big dogs and pretended to go to sleep on the sands, but neither Dorothy nor Belina were fooled by this trick, so they remained in security among the rocks and paid no attention to their cunning enemies. Finally, the hen, fluttering over the mound, exclaimed, Why, here's a path! So Dorothy at once clambered to where Belina sat, and there, sure enough, was a smooth path cut between the rocks. It seemed to wind around the mound from top to bottom like a corkscrew, twisting here and there between the rough boulders, but always remaining level and easy to walk upon. 
Indeed, Dorothy wondered at first why the wheelers did not roll up this path, but when she followed it to the foot of the mound, she found that several big pieces of rock had been placed directly across the end of the way, thus preventing anyone outside from seeing it, and also preventing the wheelers from using it to climb up the mound. Then Dorothy walked back up the path and followed it until she came to the very top of the hill, where a solitary round rock stood that was bigger than any of the others surrounding it. The path came to an end just beside this great rock, and for a moment it puzzled the girl to know why the path had been made at all. But the hen, who had been gravely following her around and was now perched upon a point of rock behind Dorothy, suddenly remarked, "'It looks something like a door, doesn't it?' "'What looks like a door?' inquired the child. "'Why, that crack in the rock just facing you,' replied Belina, whose little round eyes were very sharp and seemed to see everything. "'It runs up one side and down the other, and across the top and the bottom.' "'What does?' "'Why, the crack! So I think it must be a door of rock, although I do not see any hinges.' "'Oh, yes,' said Dorothy, now observing for the first time the crack in the rock. "'And isn't this a keyhole, Belina?' pointing to a round, deep hole at one side of the door. "'Of course. If we only had the key now, we could unlock it and see what is there,' replied the yellow hen. "'Maybe it's a treasure chamber full of diamonds and rubies, or heaps of shining gold, or...' "'That reminds me,' said Dorothy." of the golden key I picked up on the shore. Do you think that it would fit this keyhole, Belina? Try it and see, suggested the hen. So Dorothy searched in the pocket of her dress and found the golden key. And when she had put it into the hole of the rock and turned it, a sudden sharp snap was heard. Then, with a solemn creak that made the shivers run down the child's back, the face of the rock fell outward like a door on hinges and revealed a small, dark chamber just inside. "'Good gracious!' cried Dorothy, shrinking back as far as the narrow path would let her. For standing within the narrow chamber of rock was the form of a man. Or at least it seemed like a man in the dim light. He was only about as tall as Dorothy herself, and his body was round as a ball and made out of burnished copper. Also, his head and limbs were copper, and these were jointed or hinged to his body in a peculiar way, with metal caps over the joints, like the armour worn by knights in days of old. He stood perfectly still, and where the light struck upon his form, it glittered as if made of pure gold. "'Don't be frightened,' called Belina from her perch. "'It isn't alive.' "'I see it isn't,' replied the girl, drawing a long breath. "'It is only made out of copper, like the old kettle in the barnyard at home,' continued the hen, turning her head first to one side and then to the other, so that both her little round eyes could examine the object. "'Once,' said Dorothy, "'I knew a man made out of tin, who was a woodman named Nick Chopper. "'But he was as alive as we are.' "'cause he was born a real man "'and got his tin body a little at a time. first a leg and then a finger and then an ear "'for the reason that he had so many accidents with his axe "'and cut himself up in a very careless manner. "'Oh,' said the hen with a sniff, "'as if she did not believe the story. "'But this copper man,' continued Dorothy, "'looking at it with big eyes, "'is not alive at all, "'and I wonder what it was made for.' "'and why it was locked up in this queer place.' "'That is a mystery,' remarked the hen, "'twisting her head to arrange her wing feathers with her bill. "'Dorothy stepped inside the little room "'to get a back view of the copper man, "'and in this way discovered a printed card "'that hung between his shoulders, "'it being suspended from a small copper peg "'at the back of his neck. "'She unfastened this card "'and returned to the path where the light was better.' and sat herself down upon a slab of rock to read the printing. "'What does it say?' asked the hen curiously. Dorothy read the card aloud, spelling out the big words with some difficulty, and this is what she read. "'Smith and Tinker's Patent Double Action Extra Responsive Thought-Creating 
perfect talking, mechanical man, fitted with our special clockwork attachment, thinks, speaks, acts, and does everything but live, manufactured only at our works at Evna, land of Ev. All infringements will be promptly prosecuted according to law. How queer, said the yellow hen. Do you think that is all true, my dear? I don't know, answered Dorothy, who had more to read. Listen to this, Bellina. Directions for using. For thinking, wind the clockwork man under his left arm, marked number one. For speaking, wind the clockwork man under his right arm, marked number two. For walking and action, wind clockwork in the middle of his back. Marked number three. N.B. This mechanism is guaranteed to work perfectly for a thousand years. Well, I declare, gasped the yellow hen in amazement. If the copper man can do half of these things, he is a very wonderful machine. But I suppose it is all humbug, like so many other patented articles. We might wind him up, suggested Dorothy, and see what he'll do. Where is the key to the clockwork? asked Bellina. Hanging on the peg where I found the card. Then, said the hen, let us try him and find out if he will go. He is warranted for a thousand years, it seems, but we do not know how long he has been standing inside this rock. Dorothy had already taken the clock key from the peg. Which shall I wind up first? she asked, looking again at the directions on the card. Number one, I should think returned Bellina. That makes him think, doesn't it? Yes, said Dorothy, and wound up number one under the left arm. He doesn't seem any different, remarked the hen critically. Why, of course not. He's only thinking now. I wonder what he's thinking about. I'll wind up his talk, and then perhaps he can tell us, said the girl. So she wound up number two, and immediately the clockwork man said, without moving any part of his body except his lips, Good morning, little girl. Good morning, Mrs. Hen. The words sounded a little hoarse and creaky, and they were uttered all in the same tone, without any change of expression whatever, but both Dorothy and Bellina understood them perfectly. Good Good morning, morning, sir, they answered politely. Thank you for rescuing me, continued the machine, in the same monotonous voice, which seemed to be worked by a bellows inside of him, like the little toy lambs and cats the children squeeze so that they will make a noise. Don't mention it, answered Dorothy. And then, being very curious, she asked, How did you come to be locked up in this place? It is a long story, replied the copper man. But I will tell it to you briefly. I was purchased from Smith and Tinker, my manufacturers, by a cruel king of Ev named Evoldo, who used to beat all his servants until they died. However, he was not able to kill me because I was not alive. And one must first live in order to die, so that all his beating did me no harm, and merely kept my copper body well polished. This cruel king had a lovely wife and ten beautiful children, five boys and five girls, but in a fit of anger he sold them all to the gnome king who by means of his magic arts changed them all into other forms and put them in his underground palace to ornament the rooms. Afterward, the king of Ev regretted his wicked action and tried to get his wife and children away from the gnome king, but without avail. So, in despair... He locked me up in this rock, threw the key into the ocean, 
and then jumped in after it and was drowned. How very dreadful, exclaimed Dorothy. It is indeed, said the machine. When I found myself imprisoned, I shouted for help until my voice ran down. And then I walked back and forth in this little room until my action ran down. And then I stood still and thought until my thoughts ran down. After that, I remember nothing until you wound me up again. It's a very wonderful story, said Dorothy, and proves that the land of Ev is really a fairy land as I thought it was. Of course it is, answered the copper man. I do not suppose such a perfect machine as I am could be made in any place but a fairy land. I've never seen one in Kansas, said Dorothy. But where did you get the key to unlock this door? asked the clockwork voice. I found it on the shore, where it was probably washed up by the waves, she answered. And now, sir, if you don't mind, I'll wind up your action. That will please me very much, said the machine. So she wound up number three, and at once the copper man, in a somewhat stiff and jerky fashion, walked out of the rocky cavern, took off his copper hat, and bowed politely, and then kneeled before Dorothy. Said he, From this time forth, I am your obedient servant. Whatever you command, that I will do willingly, if you keep me wound up. What is your name? she asked. Tick Tock, he replied. My former master gave me that name because my clockwork always ticks when it is wound up. I can hear it now, said the yellow hen. So can I, said Dorothy. And then she added with some anxiety, You don't strike, do you? No, answered Tick Tock. And there is no alarm connected with my machinery. I can tell the time, though, by speaking. And as I never sleep, I can waken you at any hour you wish to get up in the morning. That's nice, said the little girl. Only I never wish to get up in the morning. You can sleep until I lay my egg, said the yellow hen. Then, when I cackle, Tick-Tock will know it is time to waken you. Do you lay your egg very early? asked Dorothy. About eight o'clock, said Bellina. And everybody ought to be up by that time, I'm sure. To stay updated with Willow Audiobooks, you can follow us on social media. Just search for Willow Audiobooks on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. Or you can visit our webpage at stephenalexanderwillis.com forward slash Willow Audiobooks. If you're enjoying this audiobook, why not leave a rating or a review on iTunes or wherever you happen to get your podcasts? Listener.